Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? My, my name is Richard Veruska, and I have the honor of serving as the president of Thai Tampa Bay. And it is so amazing to be with friends and meeting new ones tonight. I don't know about you, but I've missed this, and sincerely, I've missed each of you. It is just awesome for us to come together as an ecosystem. We have a heck of an evening planned. I first want to thank Commissioner Weigel and his staff for being here tonight and making this a part of his listening tour as he looks to present some potential legislation. So let's give the Commissioner a nice round of applause for being here. <laughs> Speaking of thanking some key folks in our community or ecosystem, we cannot be here without our corporate sponsors. These are sponsors that have been with Thai Tampa Bay for many, many years now. Everybody from Shrewis to the Dr. Kieran and Flavie Patel Family Foundation, Hillsborough County, EDIT, most of you know Jennifer Wellahan, Convene, Karthik is here, where's Karthik? Karthik, thank you for everything you do to support Thai Tampa Bay. SS Bright Technologies, Finance Kate, Travis Jennings, I believe will be joining us a little bit later. Home Light, we have a new sponsor, Black Stock Footage. The gentleman is actually doing our videography tonight, Imani Lee. Let's give Imani Lee a round We've got room for more sponsors too, so we'll be talking to you throughout the years. So thank you to our corporate sponsors. Next, what I call the heart and soul of Thai Tampa Bay is our charter members. These are individuals who give their time, their talents, and their treasures. And I truly mean they give their treasures a lot, and they volunteer a ton, and they do amazing work for this great organization. So we're not gonna go through every single one because we've got over 40 of them, but if I could have the charter members who are here with us tonight at least stand to be recognized. And a couple of them are already standing, so Karthik and Lotso, you know, they've already been recognized SEMA, so um, they've been, most of our charter members have been with us for six, seven years, and again, they do so much, Sheelan as well, Joe Hamilton, so some of them are already standing to be recognized, but we can't thank them enough. And also want to thank our ecosystem and funding partners. Um, as you can see, we're a partner with some amazing organizations that uh, have done a lot to support this ecosystem, so we're looking to expand on that as well. And one last group I really want to thank for being here tonight is our media um, representation. Um, the story of Tampa Bay's growth and ecosystem cannot be done without some amazing people like Warren Coffee with the Business Journal in Tampa Bay and okay, we're going to be here. And some of you are going to hear from a lot more tonight, Joe Hamilton, he's leading the St. Pete Catalyst and he's been expanding greatly too. So thank you, Joe, for everything you do. I believe Bridget Bello with Tampa Bay Business and Wealth is planning on being here, so she sends her regards as well. So moving along, I have a couple special announcements and you could probably see the preview behind me, but this has not been shared yet publicly. This hasn't even been shared yet on social media, but we were just accepted Thai Tampa Bay as the newest members of the Mark Collective. We couldn't be more honored to be a part of this fabulous organization. Um, they just celebrated hitting 100 members, and um, it's going to be a phenomenal opportunity for us to be part of center point of the ecosystem. And Al, you and Lakshmi have been so warm and embracing of us and what we do. And their new event manager, uh, Evan, has been incredible as well, and she's been hands on because we need it. So thank you, Evan and Ali. We're very excited to be part of the Mark Collective. And then, speaking of the Mark Collective, it's going to be where our new home is. It's where we're going to be working out of the Open Collaboration Center. And if you can imagine this, Thai Tampa Bay was founded in 2012, and our entire nine year history locally has predominantly been run by volunteers. Just imagine that, all on the backs of volunteers, many of which we recognized earlier. For the first time in Thai Tampa Bay history, we're going to have a full time executive director. Proud to announce Mona Patel is Thai Tampa Bay Business Executive Director. She's already standing in the back. She's waiting for the end. <laughs> so Mona actually doesn't start officially for a week and a half, but she just came back from a vacation with her family to be here with the event. So thank you, Mona. And speaking of awesome partners, this is a personal note. Um, for Laura and I, my wife, this is a date night, by the way, so we still have a date night with everybody. A date night for us is when we don't have kids, so that's my beautiful wife. We're calling the first lady of Thai Tampa Bay. So last but not least, because I know you didn't come here to hear me preach all day, and I'm going to be turning over the mic to my amazing friend Sarah Haney in a second, who's going to introduce Commissioner Weigel. Um, a lot of people have been asking me since I got elected into this role, what is Thai Tampa? 
And I've thought long and hard about the best way to answer that, and I decided I would answer by not saying who we are, but sharing what we do. Um, locally, there's three main pillars of Thai Tampa Bay that we focus on that you can see in front of you. Many do not know that between the Thai Tampa Bay Angel Fund that was launched about five years ago and the Thai Foreign Angel Network that we have today, the organization's affiliates have written checks into 25 companies. Not introductions, checks, actually funding startups, many of which you see here tonight. The screening, scrolling uh, TVs through the right actually have some of our portfolio companies. So we actually write checks as an organization and then we just launched a new program called Access that is specifically helping fund underrepresented founders. So Thai Tampa Bay, Thai Atlanta, and then Thai Carolinas actually came together and are funding $300,000 into underrepresented founders. Pretty incredible, huh? Yeah. Some of those investors that are funding that program are with us tonight, many of the charter members you spoke to before. Uh, secondly, education. You know, organizations like the Tampa Bay Innovation Center, I see Ken Evans here, thank you for being here. It, it, organizations like Spark Growth and Bar Collective, there's so many organizations that do so much to educate in the ecosystem. What Thai focuses on is the next generation of entrepreneurs. So we have programs for middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students. The last few years we've supported over 200 students. Some of them have gone on to grow companies. Now last but not least, we'd like to have a good time and we'd like to network. Uh, we have some pretty cool events. This being our first one in a year and a half, we have an exclusive charter member cruise as well. So sorry for getting on my stump about Thai Tampa Bay, but I want to share just a little bit about what we do and we look forward to partnering further in the ecosystem. Thank you, everybody, and without further ado, I'm excited to introduce a dear friend of mine, probably the biggest evangelist that Thai Tampa Bay's ever had. She's moderated countless TyCons. She's actually the chair of TyCon this year. She is the reason we're all here tonight. She brought this opportunity to connect with the commissioner. And um, without further ado, Sarah Hand. So, um, the reason you're here is because somehow this beautiful woman, Shannon, I got this email from her, and she said, we're looking at changing some of the legislation in regards to funding. And being a part, so it's, it's very interesting. I have this talk that I do on um, entrepreneurship as a vehicle for social and sustainable change. And for many of us, we have been working in this ecosystem for a really long time, okay? And some of you, maybe you were known more at one time because you were more visible. Maybe now you're not as visible. But the place that we sit in is Tampa Bay and where we are as a rising star for entrepreneurship is because of the work that you've done. Like my friend Saru over there, who has done incredible things but, but maybe you don't know him. And so there's this piece about, um, isn't it amazing what we can do if we don't care who gets the credit? So I was in this group with my friend Shannon, because I can say that now, and I heard about the commissioner wanting to change legislation. And I've been in this space around funding for almost 15 years now. We've been having these conversations on funding for this growth. And then this morning I learned that this has been his heart for a really long time. How do we make access to capital? How do we create capacity? And that's what's exciting. And, and they hadn't come to Tampa. They didn't know that you existed the same way with the voice experience that you have. And so I said, we had an event this morning and I said, the group tonight, they're somewhat sophisticated. This piece of entrepreneurs who go, there's no money, and investors who go, there's no great companies. Okay, we did a tour of a park. Okay, we're beyond that in this room. Now we're looking at how do we facilitate access to capital? How do we create capacity in companies who don't have it? And how does government participate? They can't, they can't do this, but they can make it easier, they can make it harder. So I'm really excited to invite Commissioner Weigel up here because this has been his heart for a long time. You can read his bio and all the stuff that he's done in the legal realms with security and exchange. And, um, but the truth is his heart is about how do we work together 
so that our companies don't have to go someplace else. How do we work together to create capacity in entrepreneurs? And how do we bring investors together and do it in a way with due diligence so that we have better ROI? Is that something that everybody here cares about? Oh. Yes. So, you could come up here and share a little bit about what your heart is, and then we have a rock star panel of people with experience, and we're gonna have a conversation, and that's where the excitement is. And I think they asked for you to come up on stage, because although Rich was tall, they said. Commissioner, would you mind speaking from the podium? So we can capture the amazing okay, awesome. great. <laughs> and uh, Rich, I'll let you have this back. Thank you, sir, that was. That was amazing. It's funny, uh, 15 years, she said, and uh, um, 15 years ago was pretty much when I started, um, I, I'm, by background, I'm a securities attorney, and, uh, and I started realizing that there was just no capital market in Florida, and that was driving me, I, I work in Miami, and, uh, and to keep my practice alive, I was, really working nationally to, uh, to try to represent companies and um, consult for them, do what I did. But, uh, um, and, and I wanted to change it. I wanted to, you know, like we, we had critical mass. We have all the, all the pieces in the state, it seemed like, to, uh, to actually be more than we were. And, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, frustrating. And so it's just one of these things. I mean, I had tried to approach legislators. I, Talk to lobbyists, and and they all said the same thing over the years. You know, the Office of Financial Regulation doesn't want to change. They don't want to do anything different. And uh, so, you know, in 2019, the commissioner position opened up, and I applied. And uh, I, by the grace of God, I got it. And uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, so now, you know, they have to work for me and take my my directives. And so we're going to do this. You know, we're going to make a capital market here, and uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, uh, but how are we going to do it? I mean, the, from the from the state perspective, we really just need to uh, revise the, the securities code in Florida, and dismantling certain aspects of it that are that are designed to inhibit capital formation, because that's the way our our state our state has historically been designed to protect investors is by making it hard for companies to actually get, get their money. And, uh, you know, but that, that model and that demographic that existed in 1950 probably isn't the same Florida that we have today. And uh, certainly not the, not the Florida that I know. And, um, and I, I just think it, it can be different. Why can't we be like Silicon Valley? Why can't we be like Austin, Texas, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, and people leave the state. We, we invest thousands of dollars in, in our families to educate our kids, and then they get jobs out, out of the state. You know, that drives me nuts. We have a brain drain. We are at the top of the, uh, uh, the charts in, as a state in, in, um, in forming new companies. And, and yet we're at the bottom of the country in funding them. How can that be? We're the third largest state. You know, we, I mean, we've got over 20 million people here. We've got plenty of wealth. Why isn't, why aren't, why isn't that wealth being invested in businesses in the state? And uh, so these are things that, that are, are dynamic. Um, they're not necessarily things that can be legislated into place, but there are um, things that we can do from a legislative perspective that I, that I, uh, I, I walked in uh, focused on. And, uh, so, but what we did differently was we went out and started soliciting public feedback. So, because I may have ideas, but they may suck, you know? Like, so, I mean, there may be no appetite. I mean, I may be just one crazy guy and, and uh, you know, but it turns out the more people I talked to, um, you know, the 15 year thing kept on coming back. I mean, I spoke to the Florida bar recently and they were, they were like, for 15 years, you know, we've been hoping that you know OFR would change, and I'm like, wow, what, you know, why didn't we connect? How how did how did I not know this? And I'm a lawyer, and uh, so you know, 
there was just a, a complete failure of communication statewide. People just didn't know who to talk to. And uh, so you know, that's, that's something that I'm, that I'm going to try to change. I'm trying to use my, uh, my agency as a foil for that so that we have a place where people can go and get information. Hopefully, I can start to um, like, uh, reduce the balkanization that Florida has between um, different entrepreneurs and different um, investors like, that are regionally disparate. Um, Tampa people don't necessarily talk to Miami people, for example, and, uh, and vice versa. It just, you, you, know, you know what I'm saying. So, um, but they all have common problems. And so why can't we start getting them talking so they can share resources and, and, uh, and get to the same goals? Because, I mean, uh, so one of my mandates as a, as a commissioner is to try to grow the, the state's economy. That's, that's, uh, that just seems right along the lines of what we should be doing here, right? Um, so, uh, you know, that, um, you know, I, I talk about the brain drain, you know, our kids leaving the, the state, um, companies not getting funded, why can't we just fund them and keep people here? You know, it just seems so obvious. And uh, so what we're trying to change right, right off the bat is um, uh, making certain areas like safe harbors things that people are doing here already, have been doing illegally under our state law, and, uh, and, and making them uh, safe places. So like um, for like incubators, you know, that uh, maybe they want to have like a, an event where they bring all the companies up on the stage and introduce them. And, and it just so happens that some of you out in the audience might be, you know, um, interested in investing in them. Well, that puts the staff this I'm speaking hypothetically here, um, puts them you know, in an awkward legal position because you know, they could be viewed by a regulator as being unlicensed brokers. So uh, you know, that, could be, that could be a problem. And uh, so we're, we're, we're creating a safe harbor for demo day. And, uh, and so that, that's, uh, that's one of the, I think one of the, the uh, uh, centerpieces of um, how we're trying to address the uh, things that are going on uh, in the state that are um, that people just do automatically, and you know it's like uh, you know everybody's doing it. Why should it be illegal? So <laughs> we're trying to make a make it a, make it a safe thing because the securities laws are savage. Um, they are uh, uh, designed to to protect investors only. They're not designed to protect businesses. They're designed to destroy businesses, and uh, and so we don't want um, at the end of the day. You know, people getting caught up in a system that um, you know can be used against them to to their entire detriment. So, you know, create a safe harbor for a demo day. We're also trying to expand um, uh, like a, a, a testing the waters um, component, so that in all of our different uh, 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 vehicles for uh, for capital raising, different exemptions, and our registration uh, system um, allow companies to uh, you know have some level of contact with, with, with uh, prospective investors to get an idea whether there is uh, you know, an appetite for their, their investment offering. Why, why, why go through the, the full expense of, of having to do it only to find out that it's worthless? You know, it's not going to succeed. Why spend all that money? So the testing the waters is an aspect of it. Uh, the, um, you know, there's a, a federal rule called Rule 506C that is a Jobs Act creation that allows general solicitation and uh, advertising for accredited investors only. And uh, you would think that would be a hugely successful um, like idea, but it's not. It's, it, it, it certainly, certainly some companies have gotten funded using that, but um, um, that rule properly um, executed would require a company that's raising money to go out and actually get evidence from investors as to the fact that they're accredited. And so most people don't want to give up their bank accounts and tax returns to a company, you know, just to be able to invest in them. Who wants to do that? You know, and so that, that is actually becoming a failure. But what does work is the friends and family rule and that the 506B, the, the, the uh, um, that, that is kind of like the, the stalwart. It's been around for, since 1980, and, and people still use it. And that's the predominant method of, of conducting a private placement in this country. And, and one of the reasons it works is because it doesn't require 
um, a company to get evidence of, of the, of, from the investor. And so we're proposing to have a similar accredited investor exemption in the state. And ours would be based on the reasonable belief about the investor being accredited. So the company doesn't have to go and get that, that evidence. And they would be allowed to generally solicit, and, uh, but do it only in state. So, um, and then there's one other piece to this, I think that might be, might be interesting. Uh, well, I'll talk about crowdfunding for a second too, but um, uh, finders, finders, we're gonna, we're gonna license finders is the idea. And uh, so what's a finder? Finder is anybody who's you know, trying to connect a company with a prospective investor and get paid for it. People do that all the time, but they're actually unregistered brokers, basically. And uh, so that's a bad thing if you're the company then, and you, you, know, you, you got funding that way through a, through a friend and you paid them on the side. And, and uh, you know, because if something bad happens, uh, you know, and the investors want their money back, they find out that a finder was involved in the transaction, they can cause the, the company to have to cancel the whole offering. So, uh, and then again, you know, all these potential uh, legal violations, you know, they're also felonies. So that's a problem. Um, we're gonna take it off the table. Now people who wanna do that, just get licensed with us. We'll do a background check. We're gonna separate the goats, you know, from the sheep and the people that wanna play in that space, they, they get licensed and it'll all be great. You know, again, in state only, that's the goal. And uh, crowdfunding, crowdfunding is dead on arrival. It's, if, if, does that, has anybody ever done a crowdfunding offering? I, re, I already know the answer. Uh, you know, in, in Florida, zero. Uh, why is that? Well, we have a statute that was created in 2015 that it was modeled after the Jobs Act crowdfunding statute, which is a national program. It's meant to, uh, it has high compliance costs. It, it, um, uh, it's, it's not uh, greatly utilized by many companies. It is utilized, um, but, but Florida's doesn't work at all. Um, one of the reasons simply is the, uh, the program requires the, uh, the, the, the company that wants to do a crowdfunding offering to associate with a, uh, a, an online portal. But the online portal also needs a license. From, from us, and, uh, and uh, up until a couple of weeks ago, um, in fact, he's in the back there, he, our first crowdfund portal in Florida, Mark Jones. Say hi, Mark. <laughs> but without, without a portal, these, these deals are, are impossible. And uh, so um, one of the ideas here is, um, first of all, why do you need a portal? I mean, if if you're a company that is savvy enough to communicate with investors, everybody knows how to, how to use email, right? Uh, if you can communicate with prospective investors, why can't you do your own offering? So do your own crowdfunding offering. And, uh, but I like the idea of portals, because portals, you know, they, uh, they offload a lot, of, a lot of the heavy lifting that, that a company would um, have to undertake to do their own offering. And, uh, but why, why should we require them only to do crowdfund offerings. You know, if they're gonna take all the, the, uh, the risk of, of doing an offering for somebody, why can't they do other offerings, the other, other styles? So we have other, you know, other, uh, you know, investment uh, categories that, you know, they could possibly play with if they wanted to, but we wanna create incentives for them to, uh, to think about doing business in Florida. So um, those are the, the, the big ideas, I think, that, uh, that I, I think you all would probably be most interested in, but, uh, you know, so this is a legislation piece. It's a bill, and we've been working on it um, for a year. Uh, most recently, we were working on it with the Florida Bar specifically, fine-tuning um, the language, um, sharpening some of the ideas. But we've been we've been soliciting public feedback for months now, and uh, and and we're going to continue doing that because we yes we have a bill right now. Um, it has a lot of fixes for our code, but it's it's really a first run. It'll do a lot of good things if we can get the whole bill through, uh, but uh, the, the you know one reality could be the bill doesn't get through this year, and uh, we have to try again next year. But we're doing a deeper dive on on the whole program and see what what um, you know what else we might want to fix 
what else, um, what other incentives we could build into the program, and uh, and we're and we're looking for your feedback. I mean, I'm going around the state tr to groups like this, trying to to get people excited about it, trying to get their feedback because, you know, like I said, we we can come up with ideas, but we're just bureaucrats, man. So you know, um, you guys are the ones who are out there, you know, uh, you know, trying to make the uh, the thing work. So. Um, now we're trying to help that process facilitate a very difficult endeavor, which is, uh, you know, trying to raise capital, and um, and be realistic about it because you know we we're, we're not going to create um, anything other than a a program that is uh, compliance driven, and uh, but the the private sector is the one that really has to you know pick it up and, and run with it because that's not our job. Our job is is to uh, you know, set the guidelines, and um, you know, kind of, kind of repaint the road where we, where we, we, we think it should be, and uh, you know, but it's it's the the private sector. We got to educate and we got to we got to educate entrepreneurs how to be effective entrepreneurs. How we got to we got to educate them how to be how to create investable companies, and we got to educate in, investors on how to be savvy. And, and what you know, what the dangers are, and and and, and educate both groups, and uh, and that's a long-term perpetual project that uh, that I'm, I'm not sure I can legislate, but it's something that I want to support, and uh, I know it's the it's got to be the part of the, the prime mission of of, of this very uh, program, and uh, but that's that's something we, we want to do statewide and keep it running, and uh, you know get. Get this group talking to people in Orlando and to to Miami and to Melbourne and to Tallahassee and Pensacola, Jacksonville, and uh, you know wherever. Uh, there's there's uh, there's entrepreneurs everywhere, and uh, and they all have the same issues, you know. So um, why can't we just talk together and and uh, and and as a you know community? get together and, and focus on these broader issues. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen eventually. <laughs> Lobbying efforts happening right there, so give yes. us a call. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, our, our bill and our, our, our feedback link is, is up on the board. If you want to snap a pic, picture of it or whatever, uh, we, we can, uh, you, know, you can go to our website. Um, flofr.gov and you'll find a link there as well and uh, you know we we're doing the bill the bill gets we, we've projected will get filed in in September and we're going to need a lot of people to 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 write their their uh, house members and senate members and and, uh, and and express support because that's how we're going to get this done and uh, and I hope you like the ideas and I hope that uh, you you will support them and I hope you'll tell everybody you know in the state and, and get this thing going. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Commissioner Michael. Appreciate it. Don't go too far. He's got his plate full, huh? I don't know about you guys, but here in the safe harbor for demo days, I could have used that commissioner when I was hosting demo days under Tampa Bay Wave. So I love that idea. I love everything you're working on. I don't think we've seen a movement like this Tampa Bay technology ecosystem before. So when you need us to rally around you, for the legislature and writing letters, you can call on us. So we're gonna make it happen, right team? All right, let's do it. Cool, well I know we were excited to hear from some awesome panelists and it's my honor to introduce the fearless moderator of tonight's panel, a gentleman who doesn't need an introduction, but I'm gonna do my best anyway. Joe Hamilton is the founder of St. Pete Catalyst. He's also a serial entrepreneur himself. He's also an investor, he's a part of Seed Funders. He does some awesome podcasts, Startup Report, the list can go on and on. And if you didn't think he already did enough, he just won some major business competition last night, which I'll have to tell the crowd about too. So ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome to Joe Hamilton. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> there needs to be a startup to bottle Haruska Energy. I think it would fuel a city. Uh, first, I gotta say, first impressions are that it's pretty cool that we have a senior government official here in this den of wide-eyed visionaries saying things like, I have ideas, but they may suck. And uh, being that humble, I think that's pretty darn cool. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm gonna give a quick intro. We had a new addition to the Catalyst. I, I, uh, I'm embracing full startup mode now as head of network for Catalyst Metacities. 
and all the real action happens on the Caddos with Veronica Brazina, who's a new addition who, if you uh, need to get to the hearts, minds, or souls of St. Pete, that's your conduit right there. So, so with that being said, let's bring up our esteemed panel of brain power, Kathy Chu from Deep Work Capital, <laughs> Ali Felix from right here at Embar, Shilin Patel, Health Access, and Commissioner Weigel, welcome back. So I'm going to kick things off with a few questions, sort of to set the field, and then we'll open it up to uh, your questions, so think about them. Um, welcome, folks. Thank All right, so you're welcome. It's a beautiful place. My, actually, my first time here, believe it or not. It just seems like a crime, but what, thank you for the tour. It's just incredible. Um, so I want to start off with a question just, just for you, Commissioner Weigel. I want to sort of set the stage so we understand what, what the playing field is. When, we, you know, when I think about laws with regard to investing, uh, I don't have a clear understanding of what's federal and what's state. So, you know, what, what really uh, do we have control over in the state of Florida and what sort of hands off because it, it falls under federal jurisdiction? Thank you. So, there, um, our, our, our regulatory scheme is, is like this. There is an entire federal overlay over every investment offering and then there's state regulation over any offering conducted in any particular state. And, uh, and so any, any company that is um, making an, an offer, a solicitation to an investor, has to comply with both um, state and federal, applicable state and federal law every time. And so uh, the, the federal system is, you know, recognizes the existence of the states at this level. and. Uh, they, they allow for, um, as long as you play within certain lines, um, the, the state system, uh, you know, w can operate in a way that is completely compliant with the federal system. And uh, all of the, the, uh, the, the registration and, and exemptions from registration that are in Florida law today, and all of the ones we're proposing in the bill, uh, we believe are, are going to be fully compliant with federal law. So if you comply, as long as you stay, you know, compliant with each of the, any one of the programs that, that we have in our law, then you'll you'll fly in the in the federal scheme. So it's safe. It's safe to say that we can get a lot of the work done with 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 state law uh, changes. Yes, I mean, I, you know, my hope is that we'll we'll be doing in-state offerings, you know, only and uh, you know. Um, getting our, our businesses funded locally. Wonderful, thank you. All right, uh, n next I'd like to define the problem a little bit. So we're talking about solutions, so I think if we have a real grasp of, because uh, we have on the stage some, some very unique perspectives on the problem. Um, so I'm gonna ask each of you to describe your frustrations with the, the laws that, that we have on, on the books right now. Uh, you know, what, what do you feel limited in? What makes sense? What's over the, you know, what's too much? Um, and I'm going to get some unique flavor from each of you. So I'll start with you, Commissioner. Uh, and you've talked a lot about the specifics. I'd love to hear sort of philosophically or from a mindset standpoint, uh, the governor, governing bodies of the, uh, of the state, you know, what is their hesitation? Shillin, obviously, we can talk about medicine and, and, and regulatory things of that nature. Ali, you've been in the mix, you know, with, with what startups have to go through to get funded. And then, Kathy, you've been on the other side of that with Deep Work Capital. Um, and you know, trying to fund companies and trying to get the companies that you're funded access to other capital. So to give you folks a little time to think, and since you're practice, we'll start with you, uh, Commissioner Weigel. All right, thank you. So in the year that we've been talking to people and, and trying to uh, you know, like get ideas and, and, uh, and, and formulate the bill, uh, we, we really haven't had anybody push back on us and say, this is a bad idea. Um, the, the only pushback we've received from anybody has been uh, within the, legislat the legislature's um, like embedded staff. They, the attorneys that like sort of work in the committees, and they're, 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 they're full-time bureaucrats. Um, and uh, they're not elected, and they, they, they're there perpetually. And so they're the ones we actually have to get through um, the first layer to, uh, you know, convince legislators, um, you know, legislators to, uh, to be able to do anything. And, um, and 
they're either in, inherently skeptical um, or, uh, you know, just, I, I can only speculate what their reasoning is, but, um, you know, change is, is, is a thing. And, uh, you know, and we're proposing significant uh, changes to the way things are done and, you know, really reducing some, some uh, uh, long-held um, ideas, long-held barriers. And, uh, you know, and, and that's, I think, maybe perhaps scary for some people. Um, they don't want to be responsible if something bad happens. I mean, bad things are going to happen. I guarantee that. I mean, you know, there, some operators are going to, you know, end up in, in investors losing money and there's going to be news media about it. And, oh boy, the new, the new program, it's, it's terrible. Look what happened. And, uh, you know, we have to expect that because um, that's really, in the end, no different than the way things are now. Um, ultimately, I mean, people who are going to commit crimes, people who are going to, you know, commit fraud, they're they're probably going to do it anyway, you know. So, um, and and uh, part of our ask is to also give OFR, you know, the um, additional uh, um, enforcement capabilities, so that we can um, try to stem, uh, not I mean, really stem some of the existing problems that are already out there in the market. And, uh, and then address the ones we think are going to be out there. But, um, you know, the pushback is always, it's always, you know, a question of balancing. And, uh, and that comes in, in, in discussions about protecting investors. And, uh, and we're, we're extremely um, uh, careful to protect investors. That's kind of, that, that's the easy thing to do. Uh, the hard thing is to protect businesses. And uh, so, you know, we, we're, uh, um, you know, we, we, when we get these arguments, when we get pushback like this, we just, you know, have to uh, uh, address it. And that's what we do. Um, you know, there really isn't a good answer um, to say um, we should shut down capitalism to protect investors. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's ridiculous. And, uh, and so we're trying to come down from ridiculous to reality. And, and I think that, you know, coaching people and educating them about what the present reality in the state is, is um, the name of the game. Thank you. And Sean, before you answer, you can take a couple seconds and introduce yourself. Um, just in case. Yeah, I guess we can be sharing the microphone. Um, my name is Shilin Patel. I'm the uh, CEO and uh, owner of Health Access Group, a local healthcare technology company. Um, I'm also you know, fortunate to have been a charter member uh, since the, the inception of Thai Tampa Bay and um, have been active in a lot of the, you know, investing in, in many of the logos that you, you see up there uh, directly and then also kind of in, in partnership with, uh, with, with Seema Jain and Kunal Jain here with the Thai Tampa Bay uh, Angel Fund. And so we've, we've ha I've had the opportunity to, um, you know, experience kind of a, a, a broad range of these 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 local businesses and um, see the progression of the investor community around here, and and it's been it's been very encouraging and very validating to see you know what's happened since the start of Thai, uh, the challenges of a small company trying to get you know a hundred thousand two hundred thousand dollars here in 2012 2013. Uh, were, were, were pretty immense. And, uh, you know, we, we would see companies at times raising for months or years uh, just, just to get what amounts to kind of a fraction of a year of, of runway for their business. And so I think when you ask about defining the problem, I, I would say that a lot of progress has been made to the underlying problem, which is simply awareness and education of this whole asset class of early stage businesses. Uh, the typical person not the person in this room, but the typical person would, you know, would know startup investing from the breakout success stories and the, you know, the unicorns and the companies that are that are you know, running the world right now and that that started with uh, some early investor checks. And so I think experiencing that journey as a community, uh, having seen companies get you know break out into unicorn status, having seen companies just get to their Series A or their Series B. Uh, has been an ex extraordinary experience for us collectively. Uh, as we see some of these exits and some of these validations, some of these bets that we all, as you know, many of us as investors have made or entrepreneurs have made, I, I think it becomes easier. But to me, the depth of this investment ecosystem is going to come from 
as many companies having the opportunity to get out of the cradle as possible. And we all know uh, there's not a 100% success rate, but I think that the more mechanisms that a company has to get through proof of concept and then be able to present itself to the investor community is somewhat de-risked. And, and I think that a lot of these organizations that are represented, even Embark here, these weren't, a lot of them weren't even here five, six, seven years ago. So we're very fresh on this journey, but I, I, I think that there's, there's tremendous opportunity, but I think the more ways, the more, you know, the more routes that a company has, to, an idea has to get out of the cradle uh, and get past that friends and family type of money stage, I mean, the more successes we're gonna see. So um, I'm sure, here, sorry. I think I'm working. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. I'll just fiddle with my <laughs> microphone over here. Then. Ms. Ali, can you introduce yourself? I'm Allie Felix. I'm our vice president of platform here at Embark Collective, and we help Tampa Bay startup talent build bold and scalable thriving companies. We're serving about 100 startups under this roof, and we're so happy to have everybody here in person tonight. Um, and I, I think one of the things that we notice um, across the 100 companies that we serve, often they seek capital to help either get their MVP off the ground, to help bring on a team, to help market their product once it's developed. Um, and we spend a lot of time working hand in hand with these companies and understanding what raising capital means. So is raising capital the right path for them in terms of angel investors, in terms of venture capital, and what other capital pathways exist? Um, so I'm very excited about the equity crowdfunding opportunity. I think that's a really exciting new and emerging pathway for companies. Also revenue-based financing. We've seen a lot of companies explore that as a non-dilutive capital source. Um, and so as we prepare companies to speak to investors, first and foremost, we're helping them understand what is the risk that they're taking on? What does it mean to be diluted in your company? Um, and I think it goes both ways. It's invest it, educating um, our investor population on, on what it means to invest in a high-risk asset class and also educating our companies on, on what that means. And also, um, I think importantly, what the expectations are for growth when you take on a, a venture capital pathway. Hi, look how this works. Um, so my name is Kathy Chu and I'm with Deep Work Capital. Uh, we're an early stage venture capital fund. Uh, we are located in Orlando, but we do deal statewide. And I'm a charter member of Tide, very proud of that. Um, you know, invent, uh, invested in some of the logos up there as well. And uh, wanted to kind of just talk about back in 2015, how we ended up forming this fund to start out with. It was under the thesis that um, number one is that Florida across the state has starting to get a lot of really robust deal flow. And it comes from all the investment throughout the decades of uh, people coaching, forming incubators and, and, and facilities like an Embark um, across the state. And now Embark level is a uh, reason, but you know, some of the more uh, kind of the more smaller and, and earlier stage ones have been going on for a while. And so number one, there's robust um, pipeline. Number two, the capital investment is still nowhere near the level it should be given the level and quality of pipeline. Mm. So ergo, if you're an investor, yeah. that's right. So if you're an investor and looking at this from an, a business perspective, you would say, ah, that's an opportunity, right? You know, you've got great investable pipeline and no investment. That means if I come in and invest, I should be able to get some really reasonable deals and you get a chance to do good and do well at the same time because uh, you can help these people who are underinvested and voila, you should be able to do this in a very calm manner, not like when you go to Silicon Valley and you're just throwing your money hoping somebody would take your money and, and that's not the way to invest. So even from a pure investor perspective, this is a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's how we started in 2015 was under that premise from a business perspective. Um, personal perspective, now my child isn't quite as old, but I have partners whose children are in college or all graduated from college. And when they counted up their children, their grown grandchildren and all that, they were very disappointed to find that the path is always out of the state. So this goes back to the commissioner's thought. Um, and that is kind of one of the, the personal reason of why do this. You know, we could all be doing a lot of different things. It's like, it just doesn't seem right. I mean, it's okay. I mean, we're not trying to like tie everybody down with handcuffs, but it will be nice if it's an option, you know, to say that very smart kids don't have to leave. You know, they should have an option to 
be here and actually build a career rather than build it somewhere else and then come back to retire. Um, so, so that was some of the starting of uh, Deep Work Capital. Um, so we fund early stage companies and uh, you know, in terms of kind of regulatorily, I guess I'll address it from the perspective of um, what we see in companies that come to us, which means they're very early stage, maybe even earlier than we would invest. And also what we see when we take our portfolio companies out there and try to get the next round, the follow on funding, try to attract those PE firms, what happens then? Um, a couple of things, and not all of this are, you know, things that commissioner can necessarily wave a wand and, and help, but um, so, um, gosh, if you think back in, in 2000, gosh, gosh, early 2000s, uh, you know, when it becomes tightened, where, you know, if you're not a broker dealer, you cannot help company raise funding. Mm. That to the Silicon Valley even, you know, was a big knock because um, a, a lot of times you have early stage companies that frankly needed help and now they don't have the freedom to do that. Now the, the logic there was, hey, you don't want a whole bunch of these, you know, so-called brokers that are out there and just like taking advantage of the company. But the regulation actually made it even worse because now you cannot have people who are willing to work for contingency. Right, so it's like if you're a startup now, you cannot just have someone who say, hey, if you actually help me, now you can get a little bit, bit of it. Now it's like me, the startup with no money, you have to come up with ways to somehow pay you a salary. And so those are the situation where you see the regulation kind of did the opposite of what it was trying to protect. Um, from our side, you know, the more modern days, um, recently we've seen deals that come to us, some from other states even, and uh, one thing I see that was really nice, and I think Florida, if we have it, and maybe we do, and I'm just ignorant of it, is that they have these tax credits that can be traded easily. Because whenever there's tax credit, every investor would have different ability to use it. And if somehow the, the, the law was such that they can trade it easily, it becomes truly a incentive that helps angel investors become more and more interested. So anyways, those are just my wish lists that I'm going to throw at the commission. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Put that on this. Um, I'm going to do one more question uh, that I'm very interested in, and I'm going to open it up to you folks, so be ready to jump up. Um, crypto is, uh, I think, uh, Commissioner Rob and I first connected at the Florida uh, Bitcoin Blockchain Summit. Um, a lot, in a lot of ways, cryptocurrency and blockchain is, is accomplishing a lot of the the goals that we're, we're, we're hoping to achieve through legislation, in that you can fund projects through coins, um, and even some of those projects are decentralized as well. So I'd love to just do another round robin and uh, to get your general thoughts and experiences and hopes and fears about blockchain and crypto, and uh, we'll go in the same order. Thank you. So Florida does not have a policy on, on crypto today, um, and uh, we're working on it, um, but uh, you know, one of the things we're mindful of, I mean, some states um, have been way out uh, in front, New York and Wyoming in particular, and, uh, and Florida, um, my sense is, likes not to be the leader in, in, um, in new things like that. Um, they kind of want to see if people like um, go out there and, you know, and, and then this is kind of what we're fixing in the securities world because Florida is like, like I can, I can give examples, but uh, you know, every every other state has done something, in in in, in, in largely in, in in the things we're trying to do, uh, one way or, one way or another. But uh, Florida hasn't done anything, uh, so um, it's kind of a laissez-faire kind of atmosphere, I suppose. Uh, but uh, you know, we um, you know we are deliberately as an agency trying to. Uh, uh, Make sure that people are talking. We're talking to the to the industry. The crypto industry is is easy to talk to, compared to, compared to the investment community, because the investment community is, is balkanized. There, every, everybody's an investor. Nobody's an investor. Um, you know, where are they? We got to find them. You know, just like anybody that's looking for an investor. So we're looking to talk to them. We, we don't know where they are, and uh, so uh, but with the. The, the crypto crowd, they're they're uh, they're easy to find because the, the exchanges, you know, they're they're already out there. They're they're big, um, they're sophisticated, and they they have attorneys, they have PR groups, and so forth, and uh, and they want to be regulated. The, the bigger ones do anyway, and uh, and and why? Because they recognize that uh, you know if the uh, the marketplace isn't cleaned up, 
then um, somebody's going to get upset about it and create some legislation that wipes them all out, and that's their fear. And uh, and there's there's a lot of heavy, you know, uh, uh, like <laughs> seriously uh, um, tough talk coming out of D.C. You know, they don't like crypto. They don't. They want to regulate them um, and, and severely. And and New York, which was the first state to uh, to do the Bit license and regulate the the exchanges that set up there, um, you know, has gone on in the, in the typical federal fashion of whacking these companies with, with huge fines and so forth after they conduct exams. And that, that's just not the, uh, not the scene that we want to be part of, I think, in here in Florida. We want to be more partners with, with, uh, with business and, and um, because our goal is to grow the economy, not destroy it. And uh, so, you know, we're, we are, we're creating, we have a, a working group with the industry and with, the, with investor representatives um, uh, to try to get feedback so that we get a conversation going because we don't want to drive these businesses away from the state. Um, we want them to actually come here or set up shop here, you know, or grow here. And, uh, and so we're, we're, we're actively seeking comment and, uh, you know, feedback. So we, we come up with the right recipe here. I think this is working. I don't know. Can you guys hear me? All right. Well, I'll just talk loud because I can talk loud. Um, but you know, I, I I tend to consider myself you know pretty pro innovation on on all fronts. But um, I have a lot of misgivings about the, the the broader world of cryptocurrency. And you know, I think especially when you get beyond the the most established and widely held currencies that are out there when it comes to the context of crypto stacked on top of startup investment i mean i think volatility on volatility creates a lot of unpredictable problems if you have if you think you have three hundred thousand dollars in the bank and then four days later you've got eighty five thousand dollars in the bank that's problematic for a startup that's already dealing with a lot of unexpected dimensions so i think to your point commissioner de defining what it is what it should and shouldn't be is going to be a really important development before crypto as a currency, as a vehicle of investment can be more broadly accepted. I, I, I would worry about, um, you know, I think basically speculative behavior, right? Somebody saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm gonna raise 150,000 in this currency because I'm certain it's gonna be a million dollars, you know, four weeks from now and that'll solve my funding problem. So I, I think it, it, it compounds the already complex and risky decisions that a founder is making to start dabbling in that world. Uh, I don't think that that will always be the case, but I just I, I feel like right now the lack of definition is problematic. I um, and and I, I feel like there's you hear a lot about crypto or some you know some subset of crypto or particular currency or whatever, primarily from people who have a very vested interest in promoting it and making it popular, and that you know that sort of that that sort of kind of pattern or that sort of behavior or that sort of necessity to kind of create the perception of value really makes me concerned um, when you're thinking about the fundamentals and trying to bet on a business uh, now you're betting on a business and then also betting on a on, on the currency with which the business is funded or those types of things so i think that there will continue to be iterations of this and i think that we will end up if we're looking 15 years from now there will be some form of platform you know ex widely accepted somewhat normalized standardized platform and concepts and agreements around policy for investment through digital currency or investment through these new currencies. I, I feel like at this time, you know, it's, it's, it's not all of crypto and all of blockchain is not yet what it can be or could be. And, and I think there's going to be a large working out process. And I think that there are probably more mature venues than early stage companies in particular, where I would hope to see that working out happening. We saw this spate of ICOs. I don't, I, I, I don't know anybody who's made money on an ICO. So um, I, I don't, you know, I, I think it's, you know, there's gonna be these kind of waves of enthusiasm around these new tools and these new mechanisms. And some will work, some won't work, but I think that's the power of our system. But I think that to um, kind of give carte blanche for that to sort of flood, um, you know, and add to the complexities and the volatilities that, that, and, and the risk that already exists in early stage businesses, I just don't think all investors will be unified on a business's decision to go down that path. You know, every investor in the company needs to be somewhat 
rowing in the same direction and believing you know the same same goals, objectives, and means makes sense. So I, I look forward to following it. I, I I feel like it's 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 too soon, especially to be melding into the world of early stage businesses. Oh, you've got a few. Yeah, I was going to say we have a we have a cluster of a, a blockchain um, and crypto technology companies building here at Embark Collective in Tampa Bay. Many of them at the Florida Blockchain Conference. I'm sure we have many companies who'd be interested in, in speaking with you, Commissioner. Um, and uh, one of them I'll share with you is a company called Pocket Network. They're a developer API protocol. Earlier this year, they sold nine million dollars of their token, and that was their vehicle to fundraise. Um, and so, really interesting. I think the first of its kind in our market to raise. Um, at that amount. Um, and I'm really excited for them. I mean, they, they've, they've gotten to the point where the product is up. It's in, it's in the hands of their customers. Um, and I, I think that's a really creative way for companies to raise who are building in that industry. And I'm excited to see um, how that continues in our market, given the growing cluster that's here. Yeah, um, I mean, we see we see crypto based or, or blockchain based uh, business plans coming and pitch at us all the time. Um, I think if I had to summarize my hopes for the regulation in this in this space, it, it will be that I hope we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And uh, the reason I say that is there actually is a legit, uh, so, you know, blockchain is, is mm -hmm. more simple to fathom yeah. why it exists. It really is nothing but a platform that is efficient, secure, so on and so forth, if it's done right. Granted, there's a lot of inefficiency, but, you know, the, when we iron it all out, I do think it's a good thing. But that's blockchain. Blockchain is nothing but a technology. Crypto is the one that's scary because now it's truly currency and people are making up their own economies now. Mm -hmm. um, so when I think about that, my hope is that people understand that by limiting people from taking risks that you want to protect them from, sometimes what you're doing is you're disallowing other people who fully understand the risk, wanted to take advantage of it, and yeah. now they can. And not only that, you might have people who have been banking on having that risk be a part of their business, and now they've lost something because of uncertainty in the regulation. Because you. You, you take certain risk on the on the kind of the currency and the exchange rate and all that, you, you, you accepted that risk and you, you kind of, you budgeted for that. But what you really can't handle is like, what's the government gonna wake up and do tomorrow? And when you have that kind of risk, then then that kills an industry. So that, that's just my hope is that whatever we do, you know, more disclosure is probably good, but not so much that they have to go and collect data that they don't have, um, but, you know, and, and certainly, you know, reasonable disclosure is great, but you just can't put on due burden. That's impossible to solve for the business. Smart, thank you. All right, who's ready to ask the most brilliant question you've ever asked? <laughs> yeah, let's hear it. Got one back here? Does it work? Yeah. Uh, Commissioner, this one's actually for you. You said something interesting in your opening remarks that we hear a lot around here, and that is why we have a lot of money in Florida, we have a lot of investors, why are they not investing in tech, right? We know traditionally it's real estate and restaurants, right? and, I'm, and I'm a real estate broker, so it's not that I'm opposed to that, but I'm also connected to the tech community. Do you think we overcome that through education, which is what we're trying to do locally? We're educating them on what tech investing looks like and how you can succeed at it. Is there any way to do it through regulation? I don't want to say um, subsidizing, but is there some way to do it to incentivize them to look at tech, tech companies and break the mold away from real estate and restaurants? Thank you, that's a, that's a great question. And, um, and the answer, is probably yes, I mean, but um, <clears throat> right now there's nothing on the table uh, to uh, uh, tie any kind of uh, economic um, like result um, uh, to a legislative piece. And, uh, and part of that is because, um, I, well, I, I think our, our, our governor um, uh, dislikes fees and taxes, and so 
<laughs> that what the, the bill that we're working on um, uh, has very little of that. Uh, it's it's uh, um, it's kind of neutral. And the the, the other is, uh, you know, Miss um, uh, Chu mentioned trading tax credits as an idea. Um, I'm not really sure that that'd be possible in Florida because we're so, you know. Uh, tax-free here, you know. Um, so, but I mean, you know, these these ideas, um, uh, you know, from time to time, the state does does something like with solar power or something. They'll they'll um, they'll, they'll create a program and and, uh, um, and you know and, and fund it for uh, you know a limited time and limited amounts. And uh, I can imagine you know that could happen. You know, there might be a startup. Uh, Fund that, they, that the state creates. I mean, that, that could be a thing, uh, but it's it's a uh, it really just it's an idea that needs to be proposed and needs to be supported. And uh, and you know when, when people start seeing the need for it and um, and and how it can be financed, then stuff like that can become a reality. Excuse me, a, a reality. Um, one of the ideas that um, we're doing a, a deeper dive on, for example, is to try to see if there's some way we can um, tie the uh, the notion that entrepreneurs should be educated at some level uh, to uh, you know demonstrate that they know how to run a company that can be investable. You know, how do you get to that, and how do we incentivize it? And I don't I don't know if we can. Legislate it. Maybe we can. Maybe we can create a program that uh, that says, you know, if you have a certain validation, like a like a certificate of a program graduation or something that uh, um, enables you to qualify for a certain tier of, of capital funding, or or maybe a, a relaxed standard of, of uh, um, capital funding, uh, like a safe harbor of some kind. Those are kinds of things we're we're. We want to hear about, and we don't really have any uh, um, like like solid feedback right now. To you know, the, the, nothing has been proposed yet. It's the, only in general notions like it would be great that we have funding for for startups sponsored by the state. You know, um, that's about the level of detail we, I would say we would, we have right now from the public, uh, and not enough to uh, really. Uh, articulate a, a, a you know a program that makes sense you know and so you know those those are the kinds of ideas that I want to try to flush out from the public and because uh, I I don't think that we're the we're the agency with uh, you know the wherewithal to really dream up those ideas I think those are things that people really need to come to us and uh, say this is what our need is so I think what's really exciting is if you haven't done a tour of Embark, there's this really great place with movable whiteboards and markers. And for entrepreneurs, it's called customer validation, right? So I think what's exciting, and in, 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 uh, we're gonna go to the next question, is that I hear from a government level focus groups, validation, and maybe we make it through this time, maybe we don't, but what if we make it through in its version one? Who here as an entrepreneur has done more than one version of your business on campus? Okay, who knew that the first time that it totally stunk, right? Right. So I, I think that I, I really appreciate, Commissioner, that you're validating and maybe we make it through, but even if we do, there will need to be funding Florida's growth version two, version three, right? Does anybody see that as, as, as part of the plan? So, question. Commissioner, to put you on the hot spot again. Um, I think your earlier comment about people graduating before you invest in them, I would have failed. I would not do that, right? I'm a second time founder. Um, but the question that I have, and actually it's a question slash statement, yes, I hear that capital is required. I hear that startups need capital to run, et cetera, et cetera. I, as a second time founder, can tell you that capital is great, but what I need is quick validation or quick failure. 
right? I need to get to where I need to get to, ask them a question, get a response to the question, and either decide that I'm moving forward or decide that I'm gonna make a change. Coming from New York City, you fail fast, right? Florida is not really known for fast. So I, while what I hear is really great, like you wanna have these focus groups and this, that, and the other, I can have a conversation with you, show you how you increase revenue, show you how you cut time, but you don't have an acquisition request for me. And until you have an acquisition request, I can't even come knocking on your door, right? So from a, legis from a legislative perspective, yeah, there needs to, be, needs to be changes, but there also needs to be some access that isn't just capital. I don't need your money. I just want someone to give me feedback on how much of a headache they have, because if I've got the right pill for it, then the acquisition process will develop itself. But if that's not the headache that I can solve for, then I'll just move on. But what will kill my organization is if I have to wait three months to get on someone's calendar and all I want to do is have a 15 minute conversation. So I'd love your thoughts on that. I'm not sure I understand exactly what you're saying. Are you talking, when you say the word acquisition, are you talking about like state procurement or? or uh... Yeah, at, at, the, at the government level, right? Whether it's federal, state. So, so let, me, let me put this together. So one of the things, and we talked about earlier about Dream It and the Urban Tech Accelerator is that the goal there is to get customer feedback validation at a higher level. So for someone like this gentleman who's doing audits, right, is, is that there's nothing worse than to feed a startup little bits of money and give them hope when they really should have been out of business sooner. So how do we get to go or no go sooner? So I, I was meant, I'm mentoring some students, I volunteer for various organizations, and one of them is a student at a university, not in this state, right, so out of state. This person has developed a innovative solution that can reduce emissions, um, car sharing, rah, 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 parking spaces, all those other problems. And so the security organization at that university sent that student who's operating a tech innovation out of his dorm room, a 300 question information security assessment. I'm a 20 year professional and it takes me days to respond to those things, right? And so I posted on LinkedIn and I said, why are we killing innovation that exists as in front of us? With the, with the I get why we do it and I, I'm scary, I mean, I get why we're doing it, but there's got, it's not why we're doing it, it's the way that we're doing it. And there are innovative solutions. There, there are different methods, but until those, until people say it's on the budget this year, right, something I've got to think about, the status quo, unless that status quo changes, we're, we're, going, to, we're going to kill it at the root. Well, I mean, if your target market is a government, like, buyer, um, and you're hoping that they're going to change fast, move on now, okay? <laughs> you know, I mean, because I, I think that's, uh, that's. And they're not. <laughs> okay. Now, the, you know, there. On the other hand, um, there we we do have a a, um, a we call the sandbox, for example, and the, the sandbox uh, um, was originally envisioned uh, to encompass all areas that my agency regulates, and uh, and that that's all areas of finance, and so except for insurance, and uh, a a bill was created. A bill passed and it became law. And when it became law, by the time it got through the legislature, the only thing that it did, or the only industry that was allowed to participate, was uh, consumer finance. And uh, so, every, you know, all, all the securities and you know, banking and everything else was was jettisoned. Um, that is something that I would like personally, it's my own personal endeavor. But uh, you know, I'd like to see maybe we go back to the original bill and try to get that. That through again the way it was proposed, but uh, that's not on the table right now. But there, there are endeavors like that. There are initiatives with the state has tried to create something that um, provided a a, uh, a proving ground um, for a possibly regulated business, you know, to 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 try out in a live fire scenario um, with with uh, regulatory scrutiny. 
you know, their 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 uh, their business model. So uh, I mean, that I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about exactly, but there are there are you know um, endeavors like that that the state does do. So um, that can be a way that a business can can uh, uh, it would be a hard launch um, doing it in that environment because you're actually expected to have real customers, and uh, although not um, you know not really going for the uh, the home run, you know just trying it out and see if you can get a base hit. I, I feel I like we have a legendary final question brewing over there. Oh yeah. Uh, or Russ, one thing you left out in the whole presentation of everything is, can you share with everybody how fast that this is actually going to happen? Because I'm pretty impressed that the timeline for this upcoming up is probably going to get in the legislature and start getting voted on. And just to make a point about go or no go, um, followed up by. What is the state going to do? What kind of budget is going to be available to go out and let everybody know that these changes occurred? Having been involved in the federal legislation in, in D.C., once it came out, it was like, okay, it's, it, it's here. But nobody knew exactly what to do, how to do it, right? And so I was going all over the country educating attorneys. This is, this is the way it works, and this is what you need to do. But nobody knew, right? So, like, could the state put on, on budgets in different key cities, and so like the incubators, right? They could say, hey, there's an odd budget in Tampa, you go over here and they, they'll kind of help you. At least for some period of time to, to get them up to speed on these changes coming. But the key thing that everybody doesn't know, that everybody today in this room has an opportunity to attract real capital at no cost. Don't need a portal, don't need anything, is to test the waters for it. That is like, hey, if you want to see if you're an investable company, don't use the test the waters. See if you get an indication of interest. If you hand an investor an indication of interest that he may be interested in investing upon receiving the offering memorandum, if he's not going to sign that, he is not going to write you a check. So everybody today, every incubator, every client, everybody in the has the opportunity to go see if they've got an investable company. And maybe they don't have it today, but maybe they want to test the waters three months from now. So that's it. Uh, thank you, Mark. The, the timeline is, you know, we're hoping that the, the legislature files the bill in September. This is 1.0, right? And, uh, and if it gets through, you know, the, the, uh, the legislative session is in January and February. And if it makes it through that, you know, and uh, the governor gives it the thumbs up, you know, sometime in March, and it would probably go into effect, um, you know, probably in October of next year, you know. Yeah, because we, we also have rulemaking to do in, in certain capacity, and they, they, they would want, not want a bill to go live without the rules that implement certain aspects to be um, uh, promulgated and ready to go, so that when the law goes into effect, the rules are already ready, not, not cart before the horse, you know? That's the sequence they like. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, I, I've lost track of what the other question, what? It was, it was it. Oh no, it was about the money to be allocated. Oh, the ombudsman's. Um, it, that's a, well, that's a good, that's a good point, because, um, I mean, we do have some money already um, for, um, allocated to our investor awareness, um, Capacity, and so we're using some of that to, uh, uh, to to fund our ability to go around the state and make investors aware about you know their options. So uh, you know, in the broader context of making businesses aware, um, you know that's a byproduct of it. But uh, we're also uh, putting on our website, or intend to put on our website, you know, start making it a, a resource page. Um, to try to help people find where they can go to get info. Yeah, Pete, so I have to tell you, so this my that was gonna be the last question, but my friend Sarusha Shabri, not not only has he been a time member forever, right? Um, but he was instrumental in the launch of FIBA, the Florida Israeli Business Accelerator. Um, he's tried the stuff that he's done in funding the ecosystem is really significant. So um, 
I'm gonna let him close out with whatever question or comment that he has, um, because I know we're just at that edge of time, but um, what he's done is, I think, worth letting us end the evening on. Thank you, sir. Alvis told me not to make a speech, so it's a question slash comment. Great ideas from you, uh, Commissioner. One um, question slash comment I can make is, is there a, a programmatic approach to accelerate innovation in the state from the government bodies? And I would say we can look at the Israeli Innovation Authority for some models that they've created from a government program. They significantly create um, programs where they de risk the entrepreneur quite a bit, even before the early stage funding comes in. And the state gets back a lot on that. For example, the Waze acquisition resulted in a five times exit when Google decided to buy them and then ship the headquarters to the US. Google ended up paying quite a bit of money to the Israeli government to make the move happen, and the state got the money back. So I would recommend that you know there's some beyond the legislative stuff, which is very, very important to talk about. I think there should be some programmatic conservation to really push hard innovation culture for that's just my suggestion slash question thank you that's a that's a great comment and uh, I share your um, your experience with Israel uh, I think that the way they they, they the, the government partners with business there and and is completely different than the way uh, you know um, government interfaces with um, its citizens in this country where it's an adversarial relation relationship almost all the time and uh, you know, I, I find that completely um, amazing. When I saw the, you know, how the Israelis uh, operated, and um, and, and it, it makes so much sense. You know, so that's where, you know, that's where we created public-private partnerships um, for different projects. Uh, you know, the, the, there are certain programs that have been done at the federal level, um, particularly that uh, you may have heard about, but um, at the state level. Uh, we're, it's a philosophical thing that, that, that I think we have um, in my agency now where we're trying to be more, um, we're trying to encourage compliance, we're trying to, you know, without just going out and enforcing the law on people and taking money from them, you know, um, that's the adversarial model and uh, we're trying to be more the partner-like uh, component, but as far as a, um, a program, I, I, there are, um, I think five different programs uh, that invest in sp specific st sectors of the state's um, economy. Um, space technology and Enterprise Florida is another one. Um, the, just to name, I think there's a healthcare one, but uh, they're ba they basically function as, as venture capital um, investment vehicles. And uh, I don't think it's exactly what you're, you're thinking of. And, uh, but the, what you're thinking of is the kind of thing that needs to be legislated, and it has to be authorized and, and funded. And uh, but it's a, I think it's a great idea. Kathy Chu, D. Port Capital, Alan Felix, and Mark Clayton, Joel Mattel, Alexis, and Russell Lovell, Florida. <laughs> Sorry, Thank you all. Thank you.